Hi everyone. So a blisteringly hot day here in London. It's 32 degrees. I don't know what it's like where you are, but um, hot all across England as far as I can see. Um, I'm Professor Sarah Rankin and I'd like to welcome you to Imperial's COVID-19 lockdown lessons. So today is lesson five and we're going to be hearing from Dr. Se Stephanie Askoff and Emma Bergstrom. Um, they're going to be talking to us about the science behind testing for COVID-19 virus and for the antibodies. So Stephanie is actually one of the scientists that has been um, working in the UK Biocentre in Milton Keynes. So this is part of the National Institute for Health Research and she worked for two months full time doing all the testing. And so she will be giving you sort of some real insight to, to exactly how that was done. And she's joined today by Emma, um, who's a clinical research nurse, because I thought it'd be really interesting for you to hear um, about her sort of current job and career, because it's something I think most people are unaware of. So uh, as always, um, please have Mentimeter.com open as we will have a quiz at some point. Um, so get your um, web page ready for that. Um, for those of you who haven't used it before, you don't need to register or sign up to anything. It's a free um, app, a free website. You just go to Mentimeter, you type in the code, which today will be 668972, and then you will be asked a question and you just put the answer that you think is correct in, in that box. Um, in addition, we have Margarita with us today. Margarita, I presume it's still sunny in Greece, is that right? Oh yes, Sarah. <laughs> it, actually, it's sunny, but it's about to start raining, so I think we switch weathers with the UK. Okay. Something is weird these days. <laughs> Yeah, OK, um, so Margarita's here, as you can hear. Um, she's going to be monitoring the chat on YouTube. So if you'd like to drop any questions for either Stephanie or Emma, please do that. Um, put them in the chat and then Margarita will um, pose them to them at the end. So let's get started and we're going to um, kick off with Stephanie. Hi, thank you, Sarah. Um, OK, so my name's Steph Askoff and I'm here with Emma, our research nurse. Um, and I think I'm just advancing the slides. Um, so anyway, uh, we both work in the Department of Infectious Diseases at uh, Imperial College. Um, and there we go. Um, so we work on uh, viruses that affect the respiratory tract um, and one of the major ways we study um, these viruses is through volunteer infection studies. Um, this is where we infect healthy volunteers with diseases. Uh, just see if I can advance the slides. Yeah. Um, so we are in fact, uh, healthy volunteers with diseases um, in a safe, controlled um, healthcare setting. Um, and we that allows us to study the progression of those diseases um, over um, a set time period. So um, these experiments are really crucial to understanding um, how the um, viruses uh, affect the human body um, and how they can um, be prevented or treated and we can use them these studies to help us develop new treatments and vaccines um, and it's important to note that these are incredibly well regulated um, studies and there's very tight regulations surrounding them. Um, so controlled human infection studies uh, have some major advantages over other types of um, infection studies. So those are that we carry them out in humans, they're not in animal models. Um, we are able to use um, a known amount of virus to infect our volunteers um, and we can pre-select healthy volunteers um, and we know their immune status ahead of that infection. Um, and we're allowed, able to do really intensive sampling of these volunteers using um, their blood and respiratory samples um, and we can follow them up over several months and years to see how immunity develops or wanes. 
Um, the flip side of this is um, that there are difficulties associated with our studies, so it can be very expensive. Um, not only do we compensate our volunteers for their time um, and the inconvenience, but um, we obviously have to pay our staff. Um, and because um, these are vir infectious viruses, we have to quarantine our uh, volunteers for 10 days. So we obviously need um, a ward setting that we can look after them in. Um, these can be quite logistically complex studies um, and recruitment of volunteers uh, can be quite um, involved. Um, and also we um, are limited by the number of virus strains which are available for use in humans um, and obviously because we're only allowed to give people mild or moderate disease we can't um, we need to be very careful about extrapolating that out into severe disease so in view of this uh, i'd like you to consider um, how much time and effort a clinical research nurse such as Emma um, puts into screening our volunteers. Um, so after, out of the last study, um, 1,858 people contacted us initially uh, volunteering to take part. Um, and I'd like you to think about what percentage of those actually took part in the study. So, okay, so, so, so yeah, I was just going to ask you, how did those people, how do people um, find out about these studies? Are they advertised or, or what? So I think that's a question for Emma, really. Oh, OK, we'll, we'll yeah. Emma then, um, sorry. But basic, yeah. Oh, yeah, I'll, I'll dig in there. Um, so we are advertising in the Metro and Evening Standard, which is reaching out to a lot of people on the Tube and in the buses around London. Um, we also advertise around campuses at the university. Um, sometimes we do advertise on Twitter as well. And through the research facilities that I've just mentioned, where we quarantine our, our participants, they have someone who's doing recruitment for all the studies as well. So they have a big database that we, we can use. And sometimes okay. we need old volunteers to come back as well. Okay, thank you. Right. Um, yeah, so these infection studies that we carry out um, really allow us to look at unique populations as well. So one of our ongoing projects at the moment is um, exploring how older adults respond to infection with a respiratory virus called respiratory syncytial virus. Um, and this is especially important because we know that immunity to this virus changed quite dramatically over um, a human's lifespan. Um, and that certain viruses like RSV and also like COVID, as I'm sure um, everyone watching will know, um, affect certain um, populations in different age groups in vastly different ways. So um, just to give you a brief history um, of human challenge studies over the last couple of centuries, um, I'd encourage you to look up these stories, these three stories that I've pulled out, because I think they're quite fascinating insights into how the field has developed over the last couple of centuries and the um, enormous uh, efforts that scientists have gone into to try and um, develop vaccines or treatments uh, and really understand these viruses. Um, however, um, the field has also had some less fortunate incidences uh, of experimentation on humans. And this has led to both international and national ethics codes and declarations, which very strictly regulate the types um, of human experimentation that we can carry out, um, which is a very good thing. Um, and looking at the kind of studies we normally carry out at Imperial. So they come under one of two kind of um, studies. We either do uh, experimental work like uh, our challenge work or our vaccine trials and observational studies on patients cohorts. So the uh, challenge studies are might be comparisons of different influenza strains. So pandemic H1N1, which was known as the swine flu and the recent um, strain which affects elderly adults um, and uh, we might compare hosts so young and elderly adults and their uh, responses to different to the viruses um, and as I say we take 
We also take uh, part in vaccine trials um, and the observational patient studies are really looking at patients who have been admitted to hospital with res re acute respiratory infections and following them up over time to see how they um, respond to treatment. Um, and what do we actually do when we get these volunteers in to do our human challenge studies? Um, so see if I can advance the slide. Um, oop, oh dear. Um, could we go back to the previous slide, please? I think I've gone too far. Sorry. <laughs> um, oh no, there should be. Mm, there should be a previous. Yes, uh, not this one. Um, anyway. <laughs> So to get back to um, my earlier question, um, could we go to the Mentimeter slide, sorry. Um, out of those volunteers, uh, so, so whoever said- Everybody, um, make sure you uh, answer the Mentimeter question. We'll just give you uh, uh, 30 seconds or so. Just go on to Mentimeter.com and we have, um, clearly have a lot of people, so almost 2000 people apply to do to take part in a clinical trial and that may be involve them um, being exposed to a very low dose of the virus and then staying in um, a special sort of um, ward for a couple of weeks um, and being monitored. Um, and maybe having blood samples taken or blood pressure taken or things like that. But how many of um, those people, once they've done the screening, do you think actually um, end up doing the trial? And, and just start thinking yourselves, why is it that people would be screened out from doing the trial? Yeah, so there are a lot of reasons why um, Emma might exclude people. So she's looking at exclusion and inclusion criteria. So um, uh, some a reason that might exclude you from a study is if you have a smoking history, um, because obviously that would affect your lungs. Um, and an inclusion criteria is if you're within our age range that we're interested in um, and we'll be doing quite invasive um, screening so looking at chest x-rays and really making sure that people are um, healthy and fit um, and able to take part in our studies so shall i continue yeah, definitely. Yeah. So so how many people got that right then in terms of this answer? So it's fairly evenly split, isn't it? Yeah. Um, <laughs> so actually the people who said 2% are right. So if we um, advance to the next slide, you can actually see um, how much work Emma um, and our clinicians um, and all our clinical um, Staff, yeah, can I just advance to the next slide? Sorry, I don't want to click again. So, so it's a very low um, number then. What? Yes, so uh, this is why it's so important for um, us to get volunteers um, and people who are interested in taking part in these studies because a lot of these answers um, can only be um, answered, these questions can only be answered by um, people taking part in these studies and volunteering their time and their, um, their really <laughs> precious um, involvement in this because otherwise um, we can't answer these questions Sorry, it's not advancing. Maybe just um, continue to uh, tell us, yeah. Mm. Um, so yeah, uh, we would take um, 
a couple of thousand people and then go through several rounds of screening um, and safety screening and eventually um, from those 1,858 people um, in our last study we ended up with only 39 volunteers um, oh. as you can yeah. see there. So that's uh, at each stage um, we kind of um, we were left with less and less volunteers so yeah, um, volunteers are definitely um, the heart of what we do um, and they really help us answer these questions. Um, yeah, so that's advancing. Um, so what do we actually do when we get the volunteers in um, and they've passed all our screening? Um, could you advance to the next slide, please? Well, we infect them. Um, so uh, this is uh, in the centre. You can see a picture of one of our volunteers. This is from when the BBC came and did some filming in our lab of our infection challenge uh, for influenza. Um, and they're actually dropping virus into the participants' nose. So we, over those 10 days when they're quarantined um, and then at subsequent follow-ups that they come in. We can take a lot of intensive sampling, so that's not just things like blood and serum. We can take um, nasal samples, so looking at the upper respiratory tract, um, and we can even do bronchoscopies. So you can see in the uh, upper left-hand corner, that's a picture of uh, bronchoscopy picture. And we can actually look at their lower airways as well. Um, and even down to, we have a lot of wearable tech that we can use to really monitor people's health very um, intensively. So two of the main sampling types that we look at that I'm going to draw out. Um, could we advance to the next slide, please? Yeah. Uh, so we look at molecular diagnostics and serological diagnostics. So I'm going to tackle the first one, so molecular work. Um, and the swab um, up at the top will be familiar to anyone who's recently taken a uh, COVID test. So we swab, um, take uh, samples from the nose and throat. Um, or we might uh, do nasal wash. And we use this um, to do qPCR. So this allows us to detect the presence or the levels of viral RNA. And this can give us an idea of the viral load in a participant um, in a, one of our studies and how that shedding changes over time. Um, so, uh, with molecular bi diagnostics, um, a lot of people watching should be familiar with um, PCR from their A-level studies. Um, and basically it allows us to amplify a selected region of DNA to confirm the presence or absence of a gene. Um, so we can then visualize that um, and using a dye which binds to that DNA and see it um, whether it's absent or present under UV light. So qPCR is just a version of this um, which uses a fluorescent probe um, in with the primers um, that allows us to measure detection of the target gene at the end of each cycle of amplification. So um, if you remember your A-level um, biology, it would be the um, three different stages of uh, denaturation, um, annealing and elongation. So in this, we use that fluorescent probe, uh, which allows us to measure the um, target gene at the end of each cycle. And using a standard curve, and I've included um, one of our standard curves from um, our qPCRs, uh, we can then use that curve um, to uh, do a dilution series of a known amount of viral RNA, which allows us to then calculate the viral titers um, in a sample. And that gives us an idea of the actual copy number of the virus or the viral titer in that sample, um, which has come from the person. So if I advance the next slide. So all of this meant um, from the work at Imperial College, um, 
I had plenty of experience working with respiratory viruses um, and uh, molecular diagnostics. Um, when in April um, there was a call for volunteers um, to quantify um, the COVID virus in samples taken from the general public. Um, and as you can see, uh, so I've given you an overview of what we did in the lab. It's really just a scaled up version of what we do on a daily basis at Imperial. So I felt quite comfortable with it. Um, so basically what happens uh, is um, you take a swab at one of the drive in centres and then they um, will post your or you post it off from home. That arrives at the laboratories um, and then it comes in to the scientists and they open it up inside a class two biosafety cabinet. So this means that the virus is contained um, within that safe biological safety cabinet. And within that, um, the, the scientist can uh, inactivate the virus and lyse it uh, so it then becomes safe to handle. Um, and this can be done manually um, or it can be done using some pretty fun um, bio robots. Um, and once that's happened, the, the plate of uh, inactivated virus can then be taken out and some control uh, phage and some beads for um, extraction can then be uh, added. And then another machine, so um, on the top left hand corner, those little round machines on the table are our kingfishers, which allow the RNA to be extracted. Um, and ordinarily in the lab, it would take me a couple of hours to wash and extract the RNA. Um, those machines do them in about 20 minutes, so it's pretty impressive. Um, and then uh, in the bottom left, you'll see these a huge number of robots which allow you to set up the PCR plate. Um, so that's meaning that um, all of your uh, primers and probes, the fluorescent probe can be added in a very controlled manner. Um, and then those plates are run using um, one of 40 machines, which is <laughs> pretty impressive. For our department, we have one. Um, these actually um, do the cycling, so they're basically a PCR machine that you might have seen, but again, it takes the uh, plates through um, the heating and cooling systems and allows the uh, fluorescent probe to be um, measured at each stage of that amplification. And then at the end of it, you get out a report that will tell you what the presence of that virus uh, is in the sample and whether that person actually had um, the virus in their system or not. Um, and all of that, including the automation um, and the volunteer scientists, meant that people could get a result back within 24 to 48 hours from having that swab taken. Um, and I think the next um, yes, so here I've got um, one, a video of the uh, one of the robots and as you can see it's picking up the tips and it's actually pulling up some of that liquid from the um, samples from um, the swabs and then dispensing it into a plate and then it will mix it up and down and what's really impressive is um, as I say, it would take um, a scientist doing this about an hour and a half. Um, these machines meant that you could do it in about uh, one plate in about 20 minutes. Um, and I think I'm going to click away. And all of that is based on uh, coding um, and it's just lines of code that have been written into that machine. So that's uh, quite an impressive job. Um, so all of that automation um, means that uh, we were able to test hundreds of thousands of swabs um, and in fact whilst I was there in early June 
and the Prime Minister visited. Um, we hit a million tests uh, and that gives um, the people, the stats people and people like ONS, uh, the Office for National Statistics, really robust data to look at the prevalence of the virus in real time in the UK and be able to track it and know what the transmission is across the whole of the UK. So that's the molecular side. Um, so going back to the serological diagnosis, uh, so this is looking so at... When you say serological, what does that mean, serological? Ah. <laughs> so um, it means uh, serum. So when uh, Emma takes a blood sample, um, you can then get serum out of that blood sample and within that serum um, are the antibodies. So I'll go into uh, the so different you, antibodies so types. When you, so just let me just clarify right. for, for anyone that doesn't know. So serum you would get by, you would centrifuge the blood and when you centrifuge it, you, it separates and all the blood cells, so the red blood cells and the white cells, because they're heavy, they would go to the bottom of the tube and at the top you're left with clear liquid um, and it looks sort of pale yellow liquid um, and that's the the plasma and if you've taken the platelets out and then it, it becomes the serum so yeah that's yeah that's so <laughs> it's <laughs> it's actually it's a fairly um, easy um, procedure it's basically just um, based on gravity uh, centrifugation and as you say different parts of the blood so the red blood cell pellet will pellet down the serum um, is not as heavy so you will then get a layer of serum and if you're using different so we can also extract out different cells as well based on their density um, yeah so we as well as serum which is our serological diagnosis we can also look at the antibodies in mucosal secretions so by that um we're obviously particularly interested in the mucosa lining the nose and the mouth so basically the upper respiratory tract um, and we're also interested in the mucosa that li lines the lungs um, so basically where the respiratory viruses might um, attach but there are other people who are interested in the mucosa in the gut um, and uh, there are people who measure antibodies in tears or um, breast milk um, or even stool i'll come on to that in a bit later uh, so this um, allows us to use different techniques in the lab to measure the presence um, or the levels of antibodies against um, the, your virus of interest. So, can I? It's been very something? slow. The computer Sorry. today has been very slow, isn't it? Yeah, I think. Ah. Brilliant. Here we go. Um, so from both the molecular um, and the antibody diagnostic work, um, we know that there are particular time points during infection that um, so other scientists working throughout the world and there's been this amazing amount of work over the last couple of months um, that's really our knowledge base has exploded in terms of particular time points during infection when you're more likely to detect virus um, in different parts of the body, whether this is blood, as I say, or sputum or even stool. Um, and it's not really until three to four weeks after exposure that the body starts to mount an antibody response to this virus and we can start to measure that and I think here you can see the IgG and IgM antibodies coming up around that time. Okay I'm just going to butt in here so it looks so you can see the red the red line so that's when you're when you're actually infected with the virus and you'd be able to pick that up from the first test, is that correct? So, so the blue test would be your nasopharyngeal swab PCR. So that's swabbing oh, okay. the uh, so nasopharynx. So that's the, when we say nasopharynx, it's basically the nose and uh, the pharyngeal area. So your tonsils um, and right. the red uh, line, um, that's where the virus can be isolated from the respiratory tract. Okay. Um, 
and it's important to remember that when we say um, PCRable virus, we might not be talking about infectious virus. So they're two different concepts, and I'll come on to that a bit later. Okay. And, and just to sort of pick up from our very first lockdown lesson, we had um, uh, Danny talking about the antibody response and the immune response. And so these are, they were talking about antibodies being generated against the virus. And this is what's obviously happening. This is your immune response. And these are what you're detecting um, later on in this when you do the blood test. So you're detecting the antibodies that would then be present in the blood. And that would give an indication that you have been infected, even if you don't have virus present anymore. Yes, so I think um, Danny had a really lovely explanation of the different um, facets of the immune system um, and what we're, um, as immunologists, we're interested in looking at. So there's both the innate immunity um, and there's the adaptive immunity. So as he said, um, the adaptive immunity doesn't really kick in until a little bit bits um, after the infection. So that's usually um, your body trying to uh, develop um, antibodies or T cells, which can provide more long lasting immunity. Mm -hmm. OK, so then Certainly, um, you'll have heard in the news recently um, about IgG um, and possibly IgM. So those are the ones that people are really um, uh, interested in measuring. Um, in the case of IgM, um, it's particularly easy to measure um, because it's one of the first that comes up in uh, an immune response. So it's a very early responder, um, but it's not that simple because there are many different or the as you can see there are five different um, main antibody isotypes and of these there are different um, subtypes so there are four different IgG subtypes um, and the IgA um, is present either as a dimer or a, a monomer um, and um, IgG is the most prevalent um, in the body um, but IgA is one that we're particularly interested in in our lab um, because it's present um, in the uh, the nasal mucosa and the respiratory mucosa and potentially um, is important in um, immunity to respiratory viruses. So it's worth bearing that in mind when uh, people are talking about antibody response. It's not just one uh, monolithic thing. It's composed of a lot of different subtypes and they all reside in different tissues and they all have different, slightly different characteristics and they um, target different um, uh, infections. So how do we actually measure those antibody titers in the lab? Um, so you've maybe heard of ELISA, so um, enzyme-linked immunosorbent assays. Uh, and these are generally, um, these give us a good feeling for the quantity of the antibody um, within the host uh, following exposure to the virus um, or pathogen. Um, and basically how they work is um, you have your antigen of interest and with SARS-CoV-2 um, most scientists have found that um, they're interested in either the spike protein which is this protein that sticks out from the virus or the uh, the receptor binding domain which is a domain which binds to the host and those are what we would call immunogenic so the uh, human immune system sees those antigens uh, and can produce antibodies to them so we can then we can coat a plate with that antigen um, and then we can add the um, serum or um, nasal wash or um, tears or what whatever you're interested in diluted down um, and then hopefully if there are antibodies in that serum um, 
they would bind to that target antigen and then we would you come in with a second antibody which is just generic to human IgG or IgA or IgM which would then tell you the isotype of the antibody that you have in um, that's responding to that antigen and then you use some uh, chemicals so uh, in this example we've got horseradish peroxidase uh, and TMB which will then give you this bright colour um, which can be measured um, the um, the optical density of those colours can be measured and then turned into a titer. Another example of um, an assay we do in our lab to quantify virus, and this is slightly different. So this will give you the neutralizing potential of the antibody, which is really important to know uh, whether it can neutralize um, a virus. Um, and these are PRNTs or plaque reduction neutralizing titers. So all we do is basically take your serum or your nasal wash and then you um, do a limiting dilution of that. So um, you can then dilute out the antibodies. You can add in the virus um, onto a permissive cell layer, which is a cell layer that we know the virus will grow in. And if there are antibodies in your serum, um, those would inhibit viral growth and stop the virus infecting the cells and forming what we call a plaque. Um, and that's one way of um, being able to show the virus again. It's uh, being able to count the virus and you can see below there's um, those plaques in a uh, cell there. Um, so there are also other ways of quantifying uh, the virus and looking at the quality of the response. So um, there's bioinferometry, um, which gives you an idea of how well the um, antibodies might bind to the virus. You can do competitive ELISAs that see, uh, again, give you an idea of the quality of that antibody response. Um, and there are also other labs um, using receptor blocking antibody assays. So there are lots of different ways that um, immunologists and virologists quantify this, but these are the two main types. So I think I'm just, yeah. So uh, some of the questions that scientists have been answering and are uh, currently answering with these assays is, we're really interested, obviously, in the length of viral shedding and whether um, this is infectious virus. So you might be able to PCR um, using your qPCR um, assay, you might be able to see the levels of virus that someone is shedding. But that's Bring just it, what do you mean by shedding? Ah, so. <laughs> um, <laughs> When somebody uh, touches their face, touches their nose, um, they will come away with tiny viral particles every time that they sneeze or cough, um, if they're not wearing a mask, um, they will be shedding virus um, and even in exhaled breath. Um, so we can use this by swabbing them to see how much it, um, of this virus they're shedding. Um, and we can also um, talk about shedding uh, in terms of stool samples. So when somebody is actually, um, there are certain viruses that have a, what we call tropism. So they go towards the, um, the uh, gastrointestinal tract. So you might think of something like norovirus. So somebody might be shedding a lot of virus into their feces. And that's a question that a lot of um, people have been trying to answer recently with COVID, whether people are shedding live virus. So there are two different things here, the live virus and then there's just dead viral RNA. And the way that you can tell that is to take stool, for example, um, or uh, nasal wash, and then you can do that limiting serial dilution and then just plate it out on those permissive cell layers. And if you can grow virus and you can see plaques, you've got live infectious virus. If there's nothing there, then you just have viral RNA. Yeah. 
And I'll, I think from what I've read that uh, it seems like the uh, qPCR is um, uh, the correlating quite well with the infectious virus, but obviously something like COVID is quite difficult um, to grow high titers in. You would need a, a, the appropriate category uh, laboratories to grow yeah. live virus. Um, so yeah, that's one of the questions that people want to answer. Um, Another question that people are using these assays to answer is uh, do asymptomatic or mild infections, which a lot of us potentially have had, induce effective antibodies against SARS-CoV-2? And a related question, how long do the antibodies against SARS-CoV-2 persist? And is there a difference between people who have severe disease and people who have mild disease? Um, in terms of their antibody response. Um, it looks like evidence from other human coronaviruses suggests that the antibody response lasts a couple of years. Um, and another question um, that we are interested in as immunologists is what kind of flavour of immunology uh, immunity will correlate best with protective immunity? So is that going to be your humoral um, antibody response, your IgG or your IgM or your IgA? Or is it going to be um, a cell type like an innate cell, um, an NK cell? Is it going to be a mate cell? all kind, there are so many different players um, in the immune system and it might even be governed by T cells or B cell responses um, and this might be different for different hosts. So um, in elderly people, they might have a different flavour of immunity that gives them protection. Okay, great. Um, and I guess the most important question that everyone wants answering is can we induce protective long lasting immunity with a vaccine and what will that look like? Great. So I think these are these are the that, outstanding questions. So the lots yeah. of work, um, lots of work for you to do sort of moving forward and other immunologists. Um, yeah, thank you, Steph. And um, sounds like you've been really busy over the last over the last um, months um, and you know, volunteering is really important. And I guess on behalf of everybody that's listening. So thank you for volunteering because, yeah, we absolutely needed those tests to be done. So um, thank you for answering that call. So um, we're now going to have a, a chat with Emma. Um, as I said, Emma's a clinical research now, nurse. And I know, Emma, that you were born in Sweden and now you're here in London working with Stephanie. So can you fill in the gaps for me? Tell us your story and how you yeah, yeah how you came to be doing this job and in London. <laughs> Absolutely. What am I doing here? <laughs> so if we could go to the next slide, please. I've just put together a brief sort of overview of what I've done. Uh, so I started, I went to a Swedish school, obviously, uh, upper secondary school, where I did business and tourism. So I was not planning to do nursing at all. That was not on my radar. Uh, but then I took a gap year, a couple of gap years actually, uh, to try to, uh, you know, figure out what I exactly wanted to do. And I decided to actually try nursing. So I went to university in Uppsala, in Sweden, where I got a Bachelor in Medical Science and a Bachelor in Science and Nursing. It's a three year um, programme. And then I started working. So uh, I did a few years in the Infectious Disease Board at Uppsala University Hospital, which is a very exciting board and a very exciting uh, part of healthcare with infectious diseases. Uh, during that time, I did some volunteering in Tanzania. So I went there for a few months to work in the pediatrics ward with children and also did work in the general medicine ward just to see what that was like and to gain some more experience. And 
uh, infectious diseases is very, very common in, in those areas of the world as well. But they are different from what we see in Sweden and over here in the UK. So very interesting. Uh, but then I decided to do something else. I needed a change and um, I thought if I go to the UK, I will learn English better and I will be able to use that to work more internationally and to go out in the world and work more with global health. Uh, so I decided to move over here in 2016 and I did a year and a half at the Royal Free Hospital here in London. Again, in the Precious Disease Ward. Um, and then working on the ward is it's very rewarding and you learn so much from it but I felt like I needed to develop my skills and do something different for a while uh, which is when I started looking for research jobs and that's when I ended up with that. Okay. <laughs> so I started working at the Imperial College. Right so when did you um, make the choice because it was quite um you know, how old were you when you decided to go into nursing originally? Because it obviously wasn't when you were 18. How old were you? I think I was just turning 20. That's the thing. Okay. I'm getting old now, you see. Yeah. <laughs> I was just yeah. turning 20. But um, I, think it, I, think it, I think it's important because lots of people don't know when they're 16 or 18 or what they want to really do and you have to sort of you know you, sometimes you're forced to make a choice um and that i think that's with lots of scientists that i know and lot people generally they move and they change jobs and you know i think that's uh, it's really important to know that you can um keep your career growing your career and moving slightly and even this move to being from somebody that was working on the wards very traditionally with patients and what we think of as nursing to somebody now going into research and again this is a, a different type of career move so tell us um, more about what is you know what's your role as a clinical research nurse what does what what do you do what's your day-to-day -day role yeah yeah uh, so I think Steph has covered quite a few things already to, to tell you what I'm doing, but uh, patient or volunteer safety is one of my main uh, main things that I have to oversee. I have to make sure it's safe for everyone uh, that we are doing these, these trials. Uh, I am also the one who's recruiting the participants. So I am the one who's advertising and then I'm staying in contact with all the people who are interested. We do a pre-screening where we send out questions about their health and previous health issues, if they have a smoking history and so on, to figure out who could potentially be eligible and who could not. Uh, and from that, we invite them to a screening session where we see them physically. The doctor sees them do a physical exam, make sure the heart and lungs sound good and everything. Take some samples and we do uh, an ECG where we look at their heart and so on. Uh, so that's the sort of recruitment process. If they are then eligible, everything looks safe, then we can enroll them into the study. Uh, another important part is consent. So consent means that the volunteer knows exactly what we are asking them to do, if that makes sense, so that yep. they know what they are signing up for. Uh, we have to make sure that they've read our information sheet, which has all the details in it. They have been able to ask us questions, make sure that they know exactly what is going on before we do anything to them. So we have a consent form where they read through sections of different things it could be uh, how we're storing the samples uh, or if they are happy for us to contact the GP about the past medical history and so on and most importantly if they are happy to take part in the research uh, so they sign that uh, and then on this slide I've put ethical approvals as well which is another massively important part Steph did mention about the history, what has happened throughout the years, and it has led to a lot of regulations and policies and ways that we can make sure that everything is safe, that we make sure that we are not putting anyone at risk or any unnecessary risk. There are some studies where there is potential risk, but then the, again, the volunteers need to consent and we have to monitor them very closely to make sure that we are not harming anyone. So that's a very, very important part. 
So I am the one who's helping to put together all the documents and we send them off to an ethics committee who is, uh, they don't have anything to do with our, with our research team. They are independent, uh, who are reviewing our documents and making sure that they also think it's safe for us to do this. So it sounds like you're doing quite a bit of paperwork, lots of it, obviously all the patient interaction. Um, did you um, have to train to be able to do this job or did you do it? Did you have the training on the job? I've had the training on the job. So when I came into this job, I didn't know nothing about research. I didn't. Well, I had obviously heard a lot about research, but I had never been working in this type of environment before. Uh, but I've been really lucky to have a very good team who've been willing to explain things to me and to show me how things work. Uh, there is another clinical nurse on the team, or there used to be, she just left actually, but uh, she has been teaching me all about how these things work. There is a lot of, of policies and things online as well, and I've been taking courses, obviously. Yeah, so, so tell me, um, Emma, you know, I mean, obviously now you've done both jobs, so you've been the clinical research nurse, which, you know, as what you're describing, and then you've been the, the nurse nurse on the ward, which, what's your sort of preference or what do you like about your current one job? I don't know if I can say I have a preference because they are both, they're so very different. Mm. They have, they give me things in different ways. Um, I think what is so good about nursing is that you can choose different things with the same basic uh, education we can choose so many different ways to go you can work for the army if you wanted to or you could work as a school nurse or you could you know go abroad like uh, i mentioned and do global health or you can work at 111 and answer the phone about people having questions about health so there is so much you can do and i i can't say that i have a favorite uh, this one is more admin work like you say um, whereas the other one is more or less clinical only. You see patients, you see sick patients, which can be quite challenging, but it's also very rewarding. Whereas in this job, I see healthy volunteers, which is also rewarding in that way. So, so yeah, I really enjoy yeah. those jobs. I mean, I think it's always nice to have a career that can grow and change. I'm somebody that gets easily bored, so I like to be able to do, I like my career because I do lots of different things in it. There's the teaching and then there's the research and, you know, all, all different things I'm doing in, on different days. So, and I think it, it sounds like with you as well. Yeah, because yeah. I think we, we tend to think of nursing just being one thing and it's great that you're sort of explaining that, yes, you could have very many different outcomes from that because certainly you know presumably if you go you know if you work for the army or the red cross or something like that that would be quite a different um situation so thank you so much um emma for that insight into um clinical nursing being a clinical research nurse um so we're going to go to margarita uh, there's a couple of questions yes margarita so do you want to um oh, yes sir there are a few questions um, the first one has to do with how do the magnetic beads work on the inactive virus plate? Mm. I think Stephanie can answer that or tell us something about it. Stephanie's still there. Um, I think it's yeah. quite a tricky yeah. question, but she's here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So basically speaking, it's that the nucleic acid um, is bound to the magnetic beads. So the magnetic beads get added to the, um, the inactivated virus. These can then bind to those beads um, using a proprietary um, solution. Um, and once they're bound to those magnetic beads, the plate can then be put onto the kingfisher and it has little magnets that dip um, with covers on, uh, dip into the wells and the magnets actually, um, the beads attach to the magnets and then it can pull up just the beads and the, um, the um, bound nucleic acid 
and then move it over into the next well and wash it in um, a series of wash buffers and then finally elute it um, by releasing the magnet. It's a really clever but also incredibly simple um, uh, assay procedure. Um, and it's something that we use in different ways um, throughout uh, immunology. So um, another way that we use that same kind of um, assay protocol is we use um, beads that bind to magnetic beads that might bind to uh, different cell types. So if you want to pull out T cells or B cells, you can pass them over a magnetic column and then wash out um, the, B the cells that you're not interested in and retain those cells. So it has a lot of different um, applications uh, this simple idea, but you find that again and again in immunology. Um, we have taken certain protocols or certain assay procedures and then applied them in different ways. Yeah, so so that's it's, like, something. it's like having a, a recipe for a Victoria sponge and then you sort of changed it by, you know, adding different ingredients and yeah. so you can make lots of different flavours of cakes and things. But it's yeah. the same sort of principle. I know I've done the use those magnetic beads before and they're tiny. You can't see them. They're, you know, tiny, tiny, tiny magnetic beads. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're so, absolutely fascinating. It's it's a very again, it's a simple idea, but it's been used in a very clever way um, to solve a particular problem. Yeah, and I think it's 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 sort of interesting when you think about, you know, all the robotics involved in your assay systems that you're using and how the the sort of technologies and like you were saying, the magnetic beads, a lot of this has come from scientists maybe in different fields. So they might be chemists or electrical engineers or physicists or something. They're developing the techniques that then will help us do our Sort of immunology so there's a lot of yeah. work between scientists as it were so it's, yes, yeah and i think that was something i was really impressed by when i was volunteering um in the diagnostics lab so there was people there were a wide variety of people working there um who might we had um biophysicists we had microbiologists we had um, people who worked on fruit fly genetics, we had um, plant biologists. Um, mm. There is a very wide um, field of um, biology um, and I think there's there's something for everyone, whatever your interest yeah. is. So it is it's a bit, bit like nursing. I think when you do your first degree, um, whatever it might be in science, you're getting a sort of, you're learning how to do the basic principles of science. You're learning sort of very, uh, a lot of very um, basic techniques that then can be applied to many different specific areas of science. So um, it's sometimes it doesn't matter too much what precisely that first degree might be because you, yeah. you, you're always learning. I think that's the thing. We, you know, technologies are moving on. We've heard in lots of these talks how people are utilising um, computers now much more and to analyse data and, and things like that. So, um, yeah, and yes, yeah, technologies. I mean, things from when I started as a scientist, um, you know, things have moved on massively. It's very, so it's a very exciting um, field to be in or, or career to be in. It's, yeah, it's like, you know, every week you've got the, you know, it's like getting the latest iPhone. You know, we always have new equipment in the lab and it's sort of, oh, what can this do? And, oh, it's, you know, this is a, a new thing which allows us to do more things. So just as, you know, when you get your new iPhone and, it, you know, there's got an extra sort of other sort of added um, things the camera can do or whatever, um, it's quite exciting because it then allows you to ask different questions and do more things. Um, so another um, question that you had, Margarita. Oh, yes, I have a less technical question. So it has to do one of our listeners asking if volunteers are asymptomatic, are their antibodies more likely to be taken to develop immunization or treatments? Uh, so for 
I can only really answer for our studies. Um, so when we're talking about um, infecting volunteers, um, we would infect our volunteers with uh, influenza or RSV or our viruses of interest. Um, and we wouldn't be looking at um, the antibodies um, as using them as uh, treatments um, or to develop, develop immunization for the simple reason that very often in most cases if somebody is asymptomatic in our um, studies they haven't been infected um, and they don't um, they don't produce very good antibody responses or any antibody responses um, with COVID, obviously that's different because you get a, a large number of people who have this asymptomatic carriage um, or very mild disease. Um, and I think that's something that remains to be seen whether those antibody, um, the quality of those antibodies are um, particularly useful in terms of neutralizing the virus. Mm. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Margarita. Were there any other questions or is that it? Um, no, I have a question. I mean, can I participate in the Q&A? Sure, sure. <laughs> yeah, great. Um, I'm really interested in getting into clinical trials as a researcher and I think there are a lot of people that want to work on that on this particular field. So I was wondering, what are the criteria that you have set in order to choose uh, your um, volunteers? Um, to actually take part as a, a volunteer in one of yes. our clinical trials. So it really depends on the clinical trial that um, is being undertaken. Um, so for us, um, we, we already have such a wide variety of people. So um, with the influenza, um, challenge studies we would do screening obviously we do very rigorous screening in terms of um, simple health and safety to make sure that people are um, can uh, be infected safely with these viruses and get nothing more than mild disease um, we also look at their pre-existing antibody titers because there is obviously the case that with influenza at least we know that a specific titer which we measure um, in the lab on our pre-screening people um, will correlate with protection against infection and obviously we're trying to infect people who've never encountered the virus before or have very low uh, pre-existing immunity. So that's something we would test you for antibodies. On the flip side, if we were looking at um, you for a volunteer in an RSV uh, clinical trial, at the moment, um, one of the questions we still have to answer um, as immunologists for RSV is what is a good correlate of protection? And I think Danny was men mentioning the, this magical correlate of protection. Um, what titer of antibodies can we look at you and say, if you have this specific titer of antibodies, you will be protected against infection? We don't know yet. So we wouldn't pre-screen you for those antibodies because they wouldn't tell us anything useful. Um, and then there's basic things, like I say, um, sm smoking history and um, like your uh, medical history to make sure that you're perfectly healthy. Yeah, and, and you're um, thinking about clinical trials, um, obviously with healthy volunteers. We also obviously have clinical trials. You might have um, clinical trials if you were testing a drug um, for example for cancer patients then you would be using um, patients or, or or looking for volunteers um, that would be patients that had that particular type of cancer so um, it just 
depends on the clinical trial. Mo you know, most often it's with healthy people and that's the early stages of drug development. So we're going to hear a lot more about that process next week when we hear from the ph pharmacologists about drug development. Um, thank you so much. Um, thank you, Margarita, for asking, um, keeping note of all, tracking all those questions. Um, and I, we're out of time now, so I'd really like to just say thank you to our speakers, Steph and Emma, for their talks. They've been really insightful. Um, and thank you for Sam for producing the session as always. So we're going to be back tomorrow um, at two o'clock and we're actually going to be hearing from a couple of electrical engineers. And this is where I was saying they have actually been trying to, um, when you looked at Steph in the lab, you could see all those big um, robots, you could see big machines. So these electric engineers have by, been trying to miniaturize that whole process. And what they have been doing, and you'll be really interested in this, Steph, they have created PCR on a chip. And so they have created a handheld cheap technology that is going to be able to test for COVID-19 within 20 minutes. So this is quite incredible. Um, and obviously, um, Steph, having spent hours sort of processing samples and um, for um, each individual um, people being tested, we see how that is a great advancement. And particularly if we think about going into countries like um, Africa, where um, they might not have these big facilities to be able to do all this testing, maybe having these sort of handheld devices would be actually more effective. Anyway, we will hear all about that tomorrow. Um, so thank you all for joining us. Um, please fill out the survey in the chat on YouTube and enjoy the rest of your day. Enjoy the sun while we've got it and um, hope to catch up with you tomorrow. So goodbye from all of us now. Bye. Bye. Bye.